Yo, what up, my conscious and awakened individuals and my sheep? This is Blake Lockhart bringing you a fresh new video today, and the topic is anarchy. To discuss the topic further, uh, I thought we could all enjoy some Murray Bookchin. Please enjoy. God bless. Have fun. Spread the word. Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? This can't be. Be what? Be real? It's going into replication. Hey, Pop. Still nothing. It's gone. It's gone. Tank, we're going to need a signal soon. We got a fibrillation. APOC, location. Targeting almost there. He's going into arrest. Lock, I got him. Now, Tank, now. to the real world. I've been given the opportunity to talk for possibly the greater part of an hour, and I have a lot to say, and I'll try to be as brief and as succinct as possible. But the subject of where are we going to go from here, which has been turned into the title, The Forms of Freedom, is something that has been on my mind now for literally decades. It just isn't 1985. And it's been particularly the case in the past few years, where I have been obliged to think about the problem from my own experience and from a very long background on the left. Where to begin? 
The big problem I think most of us really confront, or at least the problem that I usually encounter, is the fact that people feel disempowered. History has taken a very nasty turn, and let's be frank about it. We have gone from a world, how far back depends upon how far back you want to look, I can even go back to the 1930s, where people felt they had control over their lives. You lived in neighborhoods, you lived in fairly extended families, even if you lived in a city like New York and certainly also in San Francisco, you had richly articulated neighborhoods, you had very strong mutualistic support systems, we hung out on the corners of our candy stores, which were our public fora, where we could have discussions of all kinds, whether they were personal or political. There was, when I was younger, a very intense political life. It isn't so much the television has brought people into the house and kept taking them out of the streets. It's that even if people at that time, or let's say more particularly now, wanted to go out in the streets, they wouldn't know what to find. That's the problem. We have an enormous amount of corporate centralization, an enormous amount of state centralization, an enormous amount of gigantism, a tremendous amount of homogenization, and not only because of television. It's because something has happened, especially since the 1950s, which is very strategic. And that is that the buyer-seller relationship, the commodity relationship, has begun to invade our lives. You could go home from work and when you came home from work, you came into a pre-industrial society in many respects. You had your parents around, and you had your grandparents around, and you had several generations all intermingled with each other. People were not that concerned with making money off each other. They didn't invest in their family. They didn't buy ideas. They lived a real community life, however much it was undergoing decay. And even though you had a radio set that could hold you in the house, no less than a television set could today, people wanted to go outside and communicate with each other. They had developed the habits of discourse, they had developed the habits of intercourse, which came from another age. So that when you went home from your factory, which was a realm of capitalist production, or if you went home from your office, which was a realm of business and commerce, you could still come into an intimate realm of personal life, of social life, of neighborhood life. And that realm, as it were, was, was a place where you recreated yourself through support systems. I don't mean a place of recreation, I mean a place of a recreation, reproducing yourself and your personality, and through this intimate contact, it was possible to become a stronger individual even though you lived in a more collective environment. <coughs> That world has been eroded and subverted steadily by the encroachment of the factory, of the office, of the supermarket, into our own personal lives and finally into our own heads. We think in terms of buying and selling more and more. And I come across this repeatedly when somebody says to me, I don't buy that idea, and in which I respond, I'm not selling it. <laughs> and I've used this line over and over again. Because it is, to me, the typification of the way in which people deal with idea, deal with culture, deal with the most intimate relationships they have. They invest in a marriage. Who the hell ever invested in a marriage? In a business, perhaps, yes, but not in a marriage. So people, in a sense, are being hollowed out. It isn't only television that is doing it. Television, as it were, is filling an increasingly empty vessel. That's what's happening. And there, taking over the world of imagination, taking the, over that world, that dream world, that magnificent dream world that the child still has and which the rest of civilization repeatedly represses in the course of what we call maturation or becoming mature. Television has begun to fill that in with its synthetic plots, with its advertising, with its one-dimensional pictorial image of what reality is all about. This terrifying problem has made us ask the all-important question that most people do when they encounter an analyst today. Not why do I have a twitch, not why do I uh, have a uh, shudder, why is it that I have dreams that wake me up, why do I wake up screaming at night? Those were the questions that you went to 
in the 1930s if you had a psychological problem and if you went to a therapist. Now they go around and they ask the question, who am I? Who am I? What am I? Why am I? And the key thing that is involved here is what they're asking is, what is their place in the world? Because there is no place in the world for people to be human again. There is no place in the world for people to be personal and to have a personality. And for that reason, we go madly and insanely after all kinds of fashions today to decorate what is a very deep sense of hollowness inside us. We cover ourselves up. We cover ourselves up with different hairdos. We cover ourselves up with different styles of clothing. We cover ourselves up with all kinds of accoutrements. We have to wear Thunderbirds to play Indian. Or we have to wear leather jackets to be tough, even though we may be accountants somewhere. Or we have to dress like prostitutes so we look interesting, even though we may be secretaries somewhere. All of this, we wear boots in the summertime. Who the hell ever wore boots in the summertime? <laughs> but all of this is meant to make us interesting to ourselves because we are so hollowed out by the breakdown of community, by the mutual networks of support systems, by the rich articulation of a spontaneous cultural life that comes out of the streets and that comes from the intercourse of past as well as present and hopefully future through the different generational interactions that exist. And we are faced with the real problem, not only of whether or not we have power anymore over our lives, but who are we and why are we alive? And that becomes the great therapeutic problem in psychiatry today. This points to a very deep sense of disempowerment, as I said, that emerges from the large corporations, that emerges from the invasion the enormous concentration of the state and that emerges very significantly from the marketplace into every recess in which into which we could retreat 30 40 50 years ago or even 20 years ago the counterculture was an attempt in the 1960s to recreate again a community in which we could retreat a network in which we could again develop a sense of identity a sense of solidarity a sense of community that has been eroded steadily not only by television but by the marketplace by the buyer seller relationship by the reduction of everything to an object to a thing to an investment that you either buy that you sell feedback input output and that's the problem we face the title forms of freedom does not fully convey what could possibly be the point of departure for a solution? You can have a lot of free forms that can become ultimately very totalitarian. Let's not kid ourselves. Or they can become very parochial. If we started up town meetings for argument's sake, and what could be more intimate, what could be more communal than a town meeting of the kind that is usually idealized in New England? After all, that was the town meeting that gave us the nuclear freeze issue, 180 Vermont towns, along with several Massachusetts town meetings. We would still have the question again, not only of the forms, but what would be the content. These very same town meetings can go very reactionary as well as progressive. So in talking about the forms of freedom, I want to make one thing very plain. I'm also talking about what these forms will be filled in with. Without the freedom that has forms, you're not going to have freedom. If you don't have the container of glass of water, then the water will lie all over the table and finally spill to the ground and ultimately evaporate. You must have the container, the forms. But what you put in those forms can be very toxic or they can be very liberatory. So when I talk about forms of freedom, I always make that reservation, what are we going to put in the way of these forms? What are we going to fill these forms with? And what kind of people are going to be, as it were, catalyzed by these forms into rich personalities? What kind of new, uh, co uh, communities uh, will create these networks of support that will underpin personality and give us the feeling of strength that we are standing on a basis from which to project ourselves as individuals, culturally, sexually, in terms of gender, ethnically, in all our different facets of life and the different roles that we play. Now briefly, 
We have had a very rich history of free forms. We haven't had, we have in fact had a very rich history that I would call libertarian, not in the sense of the libertarian party or the right-wing libertarians. That is a word that has been stolen. The people on the right who call themselves libertarians are proprietarians. <laughs> Their main concern is to own property as the basis for freedom. They're not interested in freedom, they're interested in what they call liberty. Liberty means the right to turn land into real estate. Liberty means the right to own a redwood forest and cut it down if you want to. Liberty means, and there's nothing wrong with liberty in a more expanded sense, but it is so tied to property that it means literally owning the community. That is not what I mean by the word libertarian. In fact, the word libertarian was invented literally by Elisee Reclus in the 1890s when the word anarchist became illegal in France because of terrorist activities. Elisee Reclus, who was a very close friend of the Russian anarchist Michael Bakunin, and it's just worth mentioning this in passing, had to invent a word for anarchist because if you called yourself an anarchist, the flicks would immediately pick you up and throw you into jail. You couldn't call your periodical anarchist, you couldn't call yourself anarchist, you couldn't use the word in any... You couldn't call your periodical anarchist, you couldn't call yourself anarchist, you couldn't use the word in anything but a pejorative sense. So he invented the word libertarian. And it's since been expropriated, or appropriated if you like, by the right wing. We have to reclaim that word again because it has a much richer history and a much richer meaning. So when I use that word from here on in, please bear in mind the sense in which I am using it. Now getting back to what I wanted to say, we have to reconsider the whole question of this. How are we going to create not only the forms of empowerment or forms of freedom, how also are we going to recover the libertarian tradition, the underside of history, as, El as Elise Boulding put it in a magnificent book on feminism and the hidden history of women. The underside of history that has always existed in all movements and in all struggles. And bring that to the surface again so that people can recognize their own traditions which have been buried under or snowed under the razzle-dazzle of the academy, that have been snowed under the razzle-dazzle of official history and even of socialist history where they're more concerned with talking about the fight between parties than they are between the people and their rulers. And one has only to consult most socialist histories in order to find out what they're really talking about are not the people, they're talking about socialist versus non-socialist, anarchist versus non-anarchist, capitalist versus democratic parties. That's what they argue about. How are we going to recover that libertarian dimension and not only that libertarian dimension and tradition with the forms that people spontaneously created in great moments of social change, of radical change. How are we going to recover that? What are we going to learn from it? What were the forms that they created? How do they apply to our own times? I will not go back 2,500 years ago, I could. I could even go back to the tribal world and say that there, the real libertarian history of humanity is to be located among the Iroquois Confederation, among various sororal groups that women formed in so-called primitive societies. And there's a marvelous work on that, by the way, The Women of the Forest, which is very compelling and is forced into the format of male history and male anthropology, while all the data contradicts the conclusions how women form their own society apart from men living in the men's house. Yolanda Murphy wrote it, but unfortunately her husband was there too. <laughs> so it begins to be placed within the format of academic anthropology. I could go into that in great detail, and I have a great deal to do with the Akwesasne people, the so-called Iroquois Confederacy, okay? I could go into Greece, which was wrong in a million ways, patriarchy, slavery, and war, agonistic mentalities, competitive outlooks. But one thing at least created certain forms, one grandiose town meeting, so to speak, in Athens around 450 BC. 
from which we can learn, not on which we will model ourselves. There is nothing on which we can model ourselves. I could go into the medieval commune, which did not mean communism. It really did meant town or city council. And give you endless examples of that. I'm doing a book right now for the Sierra Club, which rolls that whole carpet out, particularly with reference to municipal life. The early towns, even as early as Sumeria, were built around face-to-face -face democracies, which later turned into hierarchical state-type structures. I could do that. I don't want to burden you with that, because it will take hours to talk about. I could talk about the magnificent revolutionary sections in Paris in 1793 to 1794. And here I just have to pause because it's so breathtakingly fascinating. They took the city of Paris with one million people, which is the equivalent of Los Angeles with 20 million people, given the communication system that they had. You couldn't go any faster than a horse. They had no telephones. They had no telegraph. The only way you could communicate was by letter and as fast as a letter could be carried, or as fast as you could walk. And within that city of approximately, give or take a million people, they divided the city of Paris during the height of the Great French Revolution in 1793 into 1794 into 48 sections. But these 48 sections, conceived of as neighborhoods, met in direct assemblies, each one of them, 48 assemblies called sections occupying churches, occupying schools, occupying monasteries, where the citizenry assembled and in a face-to-face -face relationship discussed all the political affairs of the revolution, including matters of war and peace. And then on top of that established citizens' commissions, and none of them were paid, meeting in these assemblies, to feed Paris. So they went out into the countryside and brought food in. This is the spontaneous movement of the people, not the national convention or national assembly about which we hear so much history, the figures of Robespierre, Danton, Saint-Just, and so on and so forth. These were the people of the streets of Paris, the sans culotte those who did not have knee breeches but wore long trousers. That's what the word essentially meant, without culottes or breeches, with their red liberty caps, organizing their own militias, organizing their own revolutionary courts to fight the counter-revolution, feeding the city, making decisions, and then charging on the National Assembly and changing the whole course of the revolution, radicalizing it and radicalizing it. And then finally they reached the ultimate. They wanted to form a France, not just the Paris, of a sectional face-to-face -face democracy. And the call went out from their committees calling upon the other sections in other cities of Paris to combine with the French revolutionary sections and replace the national government completely. To dissolve the convention, which is what the National Assembly was called at that time, to kick out Robespierre, they called it the Third Revolution. The First Revolution overthrew the monarchy, the Second Revolution got rid of the liberals, and now they were going to make a Third Revolution to get rid of the Jacobins and let France become a commune of communes, confederally organized in communes and then locked in into regions and real bioregions in every sense of the word. And then everything, the higher up, if you want to use the word higher or lower in this kind of vocabulary, the higher up you went, the less power and the more administrative the commune became. This was a living experience for two years in France. It's not a theory. If I wrote this up, say under, instead of ecotopia, sectotopia, or something like that, people would say, what a wonderful daydream. But the French didn't daydream this thing. They created it. It moved that revolution. It supplied the revolutionary armies. It fed the city. It maintained the surveillance against the counter-revolutionaries and the aristocracy. It was real. So I'm not giving you utopia. It had to be suppressed. It had to be crushed. It is not that it died out. It had to be crushed and its leaders were sent to the guillotine. One thinks, for example, of the priest, Jacques Roux. If any of you have ever seen, particularly the a play by Peter Weiss, Marat Saad, 
Jacques Roux had to be sent, he committed suicide in prison. The Ebertis were all guillotined and Robespierre lost control or any influence of the sections. Having cut off his left as well as his right, he was ready for himself to go to the guillotine. But I don't want to go into these details. That history has got to be recovered. We lost it. We've buried it. Or they have buried it so that we can't see it. And then there were the town meetings in New England, which then spread in the American Revolution, clear down the 13 colonies to Charleston. Most Americans don't know this. They don't know that town meetings spread all through the 13 colonies and had to be suppressed. That in Charleston, the merchant classes had to go ahead and reinstate the mayoral system in order to suppress the town meeting system. I'm not talking of New England. And they kept on doing that right up to 13 colonies until they came to Boston when Sam Adams said, no, you'll have to do it over my dead body. And do you know what they did? They kept town meetings going in Boston right up to 1850, even when the city became too large to imagine by one, to manage by one town meeting. I'm beginning to speed wrap a bit. There's so much to say in so little time. And then finally, they decentralized the town meetings and they established one in every ward. These are forms of freedom. They are the suppressed and hidden forms of freedom that have been covered over and overlaid by the academy, by the apologists, by those who have been trying to manipulate our thinking as well as our lives. And so we only get them in fragments and the story has yet to be told as the story of women has yet to be told, as the story of blacks has yet to be told, as the story of Indian peoples has yet to be told as, told, as the story of all oppressed people has yet to be told in all its richness and fullness, in the darkness, in the cellars of history as we know it today officially. Now let me take it a step further if I may because this is where it's a matter of the deepest concern for me. We have tried, and in Europe particularly they have tried, to recreate again forms of freedom. The forms of freedom that they have tried to recreate have essentially been what they call generally in Europe the extra-parliamentary movements. And we try to do very much of that in the 1930s and in the 1960s. In the 1930s, we tried to create labor movements that would become forms of freedom. In Spain, it reached its most fully developed form in the anarcho-syndicalist movement, where two million people out of 23 million in Spain belonged to the Confederación Nacional del Trabajo, the National Confederation of Labor, or CNT, which has that black and red flag that you now associate with Sandina and the Sandinistas. Because Sandina himself was an anarcho-syndicalist. Their extra-parliamentary movement could take a very distinct form. They recreated it in the form of a tremendous trade union movement that swept in not only a large section of the working class of France, of, Par of Spain, prior to the Civil War, also the peasantry. Two million. They did not have a single paid functionary to run those unions of two million people, except for their general secretary and their regional secretaries. They were given a worker's wage, and they usually were paid two or three weeks late so that they wouldn't get too encouraged in some bad monetary habits. Other than that, everything was done by the workers after working hours. After working hours. Most people do not know that history. A union of two million people without a damn single bureaucrat. The same developments began to occur even in the Russian Revolution. Again, the suppressed history of the Russian Revolution. That history was one in which shop workers established shop committees to take over the factories, and in which peasants established councils or Soviets to take over the land. And they also met in shop assemblies and assumed such enormous strength that when Lenin, in the middle of 1917, felt that the Bolsheviks could not take control of the Soviets, demanded all power to the shop committees. That lasted one week, and then afterward things changed. But the shop committees were already becoming a parallel grassroots form of direct face-to-face -face democracy within the factories and to a very great extent on the land and countervention to as a countervailing force to the centralized government as it was led by Kerensky and were to persist that way right up to 1925, 21, even when the Bolsheviks took power. In 1921, they finally rose against the Bolsheviks and were smashed and they too 
cried out the third revolution without ever knowing that that same cry had come out of the sans Kalot almost 200 years earlier. The Tsar had been overthrown by one revolution, Kerensky had been overthrown by the second revolution, by the Bolsheviks, and now it was time to overthrow the Bolsheviks and put the power in the hands of the people with their local committees, their local councils, their local assemblies. Our extra-parliamentary movement, too, began to develop, and with it began to develop a very important thing, a culture, a counterculture. And we still need a counterculture desperately. The feminists are trying to recover their own culture and develop their own culture. Peace activists are trying to develop as well as opposition to the war a culture based upon a different view of people, a different view of otherness a different view of other experiences, not as something that is to be controlled and manipulated. Anti-militarism and pacifism today is not simply a movement, it is a culture. It is a culture of how you relate to animals, it's a culture of how you relate to other human beings, it is based on nonviolence, it counts on reason, sympathy, empathy, love. And by no means a word to be discarded today because it is used often so cynically. Like, I love my Ford or my Subaru. <laughs> so we are talking in all these movements, or what the Germans call a Bewegung. <laughs> so we are talking in all these movements, or what the Germans call a Bewegung, of a whole culture, not just the cause. And I want to fill that little bit in, within the limited time that I have. There is, behind that, a certain consensus a certain basic understanding that if you are a pacifist, you will be predisposed also not to be brutal to animals at the very least and not to eat them at the, at the best. These are attitudes. You may accept them, you may reject them, but please bear in mind the cultural dimension that lies beneath these movements. They're not only movements against war. They're against, movements against a warring mentality basically patriarchal in its origins, a warrior mentality. That's what they're really talking about deep underneath it all. The same thing is true of the so-called environmental movement, which I would prefer to call an ecological movement. And that is the idea that nature is not stingy, cruel, mute, and brute. That imagery today of the 19th, of 19th century, where nature has to be controlled because we're dominated by nature, and if we don't dominate nature, nature will dominate us. You know that whole mindset. The idea behind the ecology movement that one gets into its very core is the idea, above all, that nature is rich and fecund, not stingy. Nature is not cruel. Nature is not even ethical. Nature is, and the most beautiful thing about nature is its innovative character, such that out of the shallow oceans of four or five billion years ago, life became so richly differentiated, so interconnected, so diversified, and so participatory at a time when we always stress the survival of the fittest and the antagonism and the hatred that a lion has for a zebra. That's its meal, so that type of imagery. Nature is participatory, basically speaking. Not a world, the free market world of rivalry. So behind that ecological mentality also lies a culture, and even lies a personality, a way of experiencing, a way, as it were, of absorbing the world around us and interacting with it. And I can go on endlessly. The feminist movement, with its attempt to recover the sororal relationship between women, not the fraternal relationship as it has been interpreted by the warriors for the past five to six and possibly 10,000 years. So there is a culture in all of these phenomena and underlying it all is a certain consensus that makes it possible for people to come from a shared premise in order to arrive at an opinion or a conclusion or a judgment or a decision. Excuse me. <clears throat> How are we in 1985, and I'm going to be relevant, <laughs> if I may, <laughs> but I feel it's terribly important to establish the setting for all of this, going to begin to develop 
a movement, a Bewegung, as the Germans call it, a movement that will begin to reach the American people with all the, the multidimensionality that I've discussed, not only in terms of the forms of freedom, but also in terms of that culture, that substance that I impute to pacifism, that I impute to ecology, that I impute to feminism, that I impute to all the different specific movements, even anti-imperialism, that we are all in one way or another involved in or in which we overlap with each other. How are we going to now move again in such a way, based upon the lessons we should learn from the 30s and the 60s, into forms of freedom, forms of organization, and with it a message that can reach the American people. And that is our most immediate problem. I think it's wonderful to go out to Nicaragua and collect coffee beans. But I think what the Nicaraguans want us to do to get the Amer is to get the American imperialism off their back. I remember people who went to Vietnam and talked to the Vietnamese, and the most important message they got is, please, we don't need you to fight for us. We have all the people we need. Do us a big favor, Come ho go home, go home and win the American people. I'm sorry, did I, somebody want to say something? How about the Stalinists in Nicaragua? How about getting them off their backs? I will, I'm prepared to open a whole discussion on that, but the one thing we want to do as Americans is get American imperialism off the backs of everybody and get Russian imperialism off the backs of everybody. I agree. But where is our home? Where do we live? In Nicaragua or do we live in the United States? Right now, right now, friends, the best thing we can do if we want to be anti-imperialists is to bring or terminate American imperialism as quickly as possible. That, I think, is terribly important. And I wish to emphasize the importance of that, if I may. So what I'm getting at is this. How can we reach the American people in terms that they can begin to understand? And this is a big problem for me, because in the 1930s, I talked to the American people in German, namely Marxism, and nobody was listening, except people who understood German, as a man, a matter of speaking. And when German didn't work, I talked to them in Russia, namely in the form of Bolshevism. And the American people did not understand what I was saying. Not me, but most of us on the left. And then finally, during the Vietnam, during a certain period, let's say the early 60s, we started talking to them in Chinese, namely Maoism, and they didn't know what we were talking about. And then finally, in Vietnamese, and they didn't know what we were talking about. We have to recreate today a Bavay Gungo movement that will talk to the American people in a language they can understand, and the language is primarily, although not exclusively, English. Which is not to say that we can't learn from all the other experiences that occur, be they in Germany, be they in Central America, be they in other parts of the world. We should. But the thing that concerns me most deeply is that we reach the American people. And this is the big thing we have to learn out of our experiences in the 1960s, not to speak of the 1930s. Because I'm beginning to see a stirring taking place in the United States. I travel very extensively. I'm beginning to see a kind of revival maybe in the most nascent and incipient form, but something is beginning to happen again. And then I want to go back and I want to ask myself, how can I translate, and I speak only for myself, how can I translate my libertarian impulses and the libertarian traditions of the American people into a reality today? And here I think we come to a very crucial problem. We have to develop in my opinion anyway, a politics which is not parliamentary, which is not a party politics, but a politics in the original Greek meaning of the term, not statecraft, because that's what we often mean when we talk about politics today. We mean statecraft, power. I don't mean self-empowerment. When we talk of statecraft, we mean parliamentary empowerment and that is hogwash. I know of no corruptive influence today than getting elected to Congress or becoming President of the United States. In fact, let me tell you, in many cases it's very dangerous to become mayor of a socialist city like Burlington. That is a separate problem. It's a very dangerous act because politics 
in the form of statecraft operates by a law of negative selection. The worse you are, the more likely you are to get elected. The more demagogic you are, the more likely you are to be successful. And that's dangerous. And it is corrupting almost every parliamentary movement that I have seen, even the most well-intentioned, and including some of the most well-intentioned people. So what can we build on? Can we also work only with an extra parliamentary movement? We need one. We need one because it is not only an exercise and field and direct action where people think they are taking their destiny into their own hands and often do. It's great to have a strike. It's great to have a blockade. It's great to have a demonstration. It's great to form cultural enclaves, to become squatters, to try to redeem areas and so on and so forth that have been abandoned by the cities and the like. But that too has to be translated into something more definite. And there was a way of doing it. In Spain, they took the extra parliamentary movement and turned it into trade unions called the CNT. Had two million members, got involved in a civil war, after which one million people died in the civil war. I'm not saying that their strategy was right or wrong, but at least they institutionalized or organized their extra parliamentary movement. That's one alternative. The usual alternative, quite aside from Gandhi, was finally to rise in insurrection. <laughs> Let's face it. I mean, when you go from step to step and block to block, you finally wind up on a barricade. And how many people sincerely believe today that the barricade is more than a symbol? As I look upon 1930s, and when I think of the uprising of the Austrian workers in 1934, who at least could bring rifle against rifle, machine gun against machine gun, and saw how they were smashed, or when I think of the Spanish Revolution for three years, then I ask myself how today, in an era of nerve gas, in an era of supersonic aircraft, in an era of green beret, brainless whatever, in an era right now of who knows what type of weaponry, can one today seriously talk of an insurrection except as a symbol? And what can the barricade be than other a symbol? Let's face it now. If Frederick Engels in 1880 could make the declaration that the barricade was finished because of artillery, what can I say in the face of the neutron bomb? What can I say in the, spa in the face of space warfare? So how is the extra parliamentary movement, which is the feeding ground, the nourishing ground, the soil of a culture, be translated into a politics that will not at the same time be parliamentary, that will not be statecraft, but that will also, as it were, nourish the extra parliamentary movement. And here I come up against some very valuable American, quotes, libertarian traditions. Americans believe that they do not like a centralized state. They at least believe it, whether they do or they do not like a centralized state. That is our national mythology. The state is at best a necessary evil, at worst it's an absolute sin. So that's the first thing. They believe that. And let me tell you, there can be mythologies that are stronger than realities. The Americans also believe, as a national mythology, whether real or not, that they believe in a decentralized society. That is built in to the American dream, that other dream, that this is the New Jerusalem, not only the place where the streets are paved of gold. There are two American dreams. One is that this is the new world, admittedly one stolen from the Indians and built on the backs of slaves and women, but still it is the new world. The land where you can innovate, the land where you can have freedom, the way, land where you can have liberty. And they therefore believe not only that the state is at best a necessary evil and at worst an absolute sin, they also believe in a decentralized society. In Vermont, one of our state legislatures happened to use a legal term. He said the communities and towns of Vermont are creatures of the state. He was the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee in the state of Vermont. That caused such an uproar, even though it's legally correct, that he had to resign his position and he was not re-elected at the next election. It hung around him like an albatross. So Americans believe that their locality is the basic social unit of their politics. They believe that their society is a decentralized society. That's what they mean by federalism. Unfortunately, it also means a lot of power is given to the corporations and to the private proprietors. Nobody denies that. They believe in the life 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness, that people have a right to pursue happiness, not only own property. That is also part of their national mythology, or our national mythology. The revolution was not fought simply to establish the Boston bourgeoisie and put it into power. That was not why Dan Shays fought and then later went into revolt against Boston in 1787. That's not why the Articles of Confederation were written. That is not why the Bill of Rights was conceded because of the enormous popular pressure to make the Constitution acceptable during the time when it was finally voted into existence. So there is a libertarian dimension in our revolution and in our tradition. Why do we let the right take it over? Why do we permit Reagan to become the spokesperson of it? And let's be frank, the spokesman of it, because that's macho if you ever saw it. Why do we permit libertarian parties, if you like, authoritarian groups, the Posse Comitatus, the Ku Klux Klan, all of these groups that take over this rich libertarian tradition that farmers with muskets in hand, small people in different walks of life, fought for, and that they forced the Hamilton to concede to. They forced a Samuel, a John Adams to concede to. Why do we let them take it over? And why do we go on again, in many cases repeating, again, the old slogans of Soviets, of social democratic parties or socialist parties or whatever you like? Why do we let them take it over? Why don't we did what the Spanish anarchists did in Spain and what the Russian Orodniki did in Russia? They said that the Spanish Pueblo, Catholic, patriarchal, feudal, had a libertarian dimension to it. It had mutualism, it had a shared commonality, it believed very much in the rights of the individual. It was a dissident movement that the monarchy could all but control, and hardly did control. And there were also regions in Spain, Catalonia, Basque, and so on and so forth. And as we have them here in the United States, the Spaniards wanted a confederation, not a national state, and the Americans wanted a confederation. They had that national state slipped in on them. And in many, many respects, they've been thinking confederally, and we've permitted reaction to take that over. Can we build a program of the future, radical, that speaks in English, not in German, not in Russian, not in Chinese, with all due respect to these movements, and that speaks to them on the level that is most intimate in their lives, their neighborhoods, which are in a state of dissolution, their communities, which are in a state of dissolution today, their blocks, be it on the city level or their towns, be it on a somewhat agrarian level. Can we not build out of that a movement? And that involves literally recreating again popular forms of organization that are acceptable to the American mind. The town meeting at least in New England, various kinds of neighborhood groups in other parts of the country and possibly even the town meeting may again sweep not over 13 colonies but over 50 states. I don't know. Why can't we recreate out of that a movement? Call it green, call it bioregional, but at least a movement that will invent a real libertarian politics, one that is not statecraft on the one side, that is not trying to take over, and thank God we can't anyway, the Congress, and that will be busy corrupting itself, trying to do so, and never even succeeding. And on the other side, try to create in its other form a politics in the Hellenic sense that brings people together in a new form of community-type organization. These forms of freedom lie at our disposal out of our traditions. Americans cannot translate town meetings into Soviets. That's foreign to them. They cannot translate municipal organizations confederally organized into what? Bolshevik parties or whatever you like. 
They can't make that translation. Why don't we speak to them in their language and find the libertarian content of their ideals? That is the cardinal problem of empowerment. And all the more so on the municipal level, not on the state level or national level, because the municipality is the grassroots we're always talking about anyway. Where is that grassroots if not in the municipality, if not in the neighborhoods, if not in our immediate communities? Where is the basis for confederating these grassroots and municipalities if not in our bioregions, in our counties, use whatever term you like? And why can't we do as the Sans Colot did in 1793, but in English, not in French, say we want the confederation of municipalities that will confront and act as a countervening force to the growing nation state, the growing centralized corporations, the growing economic enterprises, multinationals, and the growing military system, ever more centralized and ever more united, that threatens literally to finally expropriate us of that very dream and of the very spirit of rebellion upon which all our hopes must ultimately last and ultimately depend. Here and I submit to you as a new municipal agenda, a libertarian municipalism that is translatable into English, that is translatable into the American, the better aspect of the American dream, that can also fuse and even recreate an extra-parliamentary movement. In other words, oddly enough, our extra-parliamentary movement in a sense has been there all the time and we have never used it. That's what I'm saying. And if I use the word politics, I do not mean statecraft. I use it in the Greek sense of the politia, of the polis, namely of the so-called city-state, a terrible translation, which in no way applies to what I'm talking about. The assembly of the people. This, I submit to you, forms a conceivable framework, ecological in character, countercultural in character, feminist in its perspective, ethnic in its perspective, rich in the traditions of American ideals, translatable into a language that Americans can understand, that might form the basis for a new kind of, if you like, libertarian municipalism, a new kind of politics which will free us or at least the rest of the development of the centralized state and corporations and try to reach the people on that one level of existence which is most intimate to them, and that is the level of their community. That is what I would submit might be an agenda, not only for 1985, but for the rest of the century. Thank you. Well, that's a good one.